Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Twit Specials is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Some people talk, some people plan, and then some people make. I'm Father Robert Ballasare, the digital Jesuit with Twit TV, and I'm at Maker Fair 2014, the biggest show and tell on earth. If you grew up before the internet, you probably remember playing with the Spirograph, that little pencil-y thing that made those cool shapes. Well, I'm standing next to Chris Espinoza, who's made a giant version that paints on the sidewalk. Chris, what is this? Well, it's a giant Spirograph. It's made with parts that you can get at a hardware store, an old mountain bike, a scooter, uh, an umbrella stand from Ikea, just basically stuff lying around the house. It rolls liquid chalk onto the paint in a Spirograph pattern. Now, the cool thing about this is it, it is such the spirit of Maker. It's, it's just a collection of parts that work. It, it, it uses reduction gear to make an inner wheel spin so that you could get these really cool patterns. And I see that you've been busy. They're everywhere. Oh, they're everywhere. Um, it just started working at 10 o'clock this morning. I've been working on it. There were like 17 different designs for how to get the chalk down. And it finally started working this morning. Kids hopped on the scooter and immediately started making dozens of designs. Now that you've conquered the giant spirograph market, uh, what do you think is next? Oh, I think the next thing is to make it robotic. Have a, a robot with, that you control with an iPhone make the giant spirograph. I like the kid power, too. The kid power is great. That's Chris Espinoza, and we welcome our giant spirograph robotic overlords. We're here at the racetrack, and I'm sitting next to Leo from Team Radlamp, who um, well built a prize-winning car. Leo, tell me, what is this? Uh, it is our Power Wheels Mustang that we built up from the ground with a go-kart body and the shell of a Power Wheels car. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, so you took a toy car, souped it up, added batteries, added a serious motor, and you turned it into a contender. Yes. <laughs> Now tell me a little bit about what went into your mind as you were designing this, because obviously you were racing against some teams here who had some serious backing. In fact, there was Team Ferrari who had a custom-built chassis, custom-built motor, custom-built batteries. You kind of made a, a hobbyist dream. Yeah, uh, basically what we did, which was different from what we saw that everyone else had, is everyone had like a like almost like a go-kart motor with that was run on electricity. Whereas we just have six batteries that power ours with two electric, uh, with two wheelchair motors. So what that did was that gave you a lot of starting torque, right? I, I noticed that uh, your car was much faster off the line, even if it didn't have the top speed. Exactly. And that can also be changed with our speed controller, so we can get even a higher top speed out of it. Now, Leo, if there was someone who was looking to build their own electric vehicle, their own go-kart, what advice would you, that you give them? I mean, what, what have you learned from the build that you say, well, you should, you should avoid this? Avoid not being prepared. Always get probably some of the best parts you can get, like tires. Get extra batteries, especially if you're going to do racing. Uh, kind of look for things that can be easily fixed and don't need too much work. Leo, thank you very much for talking to us. This is Team Radlamp, built from the ground up by Makers. We're here at the Radio Shack booth where people are learning to solder. I'm sitting next to Jennifer. Jennifer, this is the second year that we've been at Maker, the second year I've seen Radio Shack here. You're again teaching people how to solder. What, what is Radio Shack doing at Maker Fair? 
Well, one of the um, big shifts that we've made since our new CEO, Joe Magnaca, came on board a year ago is really to get um, back focused on the customer. And there's no more uh, loyal customer and passionate customer for us than the makers. And so it's been a part of our brand for a while and we've been partnering with uh, Make Media for quite some time and teaching people how to solder. But this year we actually brought our entire executive team out to meet, meet our customer and to really get to know how we can serve them better. Okay. Now I'm going to be honest because our audience is really tech savvy and, and, and I grew up with Radio Shack. Radio Shack was always where I went when I needed parts for a project. But a lot of them haven't had that experience. They didn't grow up knowing Radio Shack the way I have. What do you think Radio Shack is doing to make sure that people understand that, look, it's not just soldering irons, it's not just little LEDs, but, but Radio Shack really has all the parts that someone might need to put together anything from a beginning to an intermediate to an advanced project. People be surprised at the things that we actually do carry, you know, today, but really look into widen that assortment that much more, build a much stronger online presence, do things like partner with Make Media on projects, and as well as bring kind of some new things to market like robotics kits and things like that, um, and partnering with schools so that they understand we're really a go-to place for these types of things. Right, Jennifer, let me ask you, if someone was just getting started, like any of the kids who are behind us, what would be the advice that you give them? I mean, obviously you're telling them to, to dive right in because you're giving them these soldering stations. They're, they're actually they're creating these little robot rockets for, for Maker Faire. But what advice, what enticement would you give to the young maker? I would say you have to start somewhere, so don't be afraid to go and, and tackle a project. If you go into Radio Shack, we actually have a lot of beginner starter kits, um, as well as online. There's a lot of great information, project kits for the young maker and starter. So I would just say start somewhere, as well as coming out here to the Maker Fair, I think is a great thing. It's really geared towards those beginners and helping people become make makers. Jennifer, thank you so very much for talking to us. Thank you for sharing the Radio Shack vision for the maker. I'm Father Robert Ballas here, and uh, you heard it. Just get started. You know, one of the questions that is always asked here at Maker Fair is, Jason, how long have you wanted to be a giant cardboard robot? I, I think ever since I've seen a robot, and I'm, cardboard is just a natural material for me. And so, yeah, I've, I've created this suit. Well, now you know. Do you remember when you were a kid, you received a brand new toy, and even though the toy was fascinating, the thing that most drew your attention was the giant cardboard box that came in. Well, we're here at Giant Cardboard Robot, and they're trying to remind you of the passion you had for this most flexible of maker materials. Now, it may seem a little silly to make things like giant robot arms out of cardboard, but you got to remember, when we're talking about the maker generation, we're talking about introducing kids to designing and to building something from their imagination at a young age. And what better material than cardboard? A lot of people think that Maker Faire is all about being outdoors, and indeed most of the exhibits are out in the sun. But here in the dark hall, you'll find all sorts of glowy, sparky exhibits. Things like LED squares that glow and, uh, oh, I don't know, Tesla coils. Let's go take a look. Sometimes, all you need to be a maker is a flashy light. Now, one of the things here at Maker Fair that we're all about is finding new ways to introduce science topics to the youngins. And here we have one from Norman Tuck. This is an exhibit that you find at the Exploratorium. Now, what exactly does this do? Well, these strings can vibrate at a certain frequency. We all know that, right? And that's why they make sound. If I, if I were to hold up this microphone right now, you'd hear this. The problem is, if you try to tell someone that these are sound waves, they may or may not understand you. Now, you could show them by using a strobe. If you strobe a light on this, you'll actually see the individual waves, or you could do this. Spinning the drum is essentially a strobe light. Now, the cool thing about this exhibit is I can, with this pedal, 
change the frequency of the sound waves as they travel through these strings so that they can get a visual representation of what a sound wave actually looks like. Just one of the few things that you'll see here at Maker Faire 2014. Will it survive? Whatever it goes! It is a time in. The maker spirit is all about turning an idea into reality. But sometimes you need a lab. I'm Father Robert Ballister, and I'm here at the Fab Lab booth at Maker Faire 2014. I'm standing next to Tyrone, who's going to tell us a little bit about, well, this. What is this? So this is uh, the mobile fab lab that is on loan to us uh, from MIT and, and what the mobile fab lab does is it travels throughout the, the country and the world is, if I'm correct, um, going to many of the locations uh, that, are, that were affiliated with the MIT fab lab program. So the fab lab program was started a few years ago as a way to get a better community outreach with the technologies that are becoming more um, ubiquitous throughout today's maker spaces and those types of things. Now, a lot of people just associate things like 3D printers or maker bots with the maker movement. But obviously, you've got way more equipment in here and, and way high ca higher caliber than the standard desktop maker bot. What kind of equipment might people want to use if they were going to use a Fab Lab or a, a mobile maker space? Um, you know, you mentioned the, the, the main ones, like you said, that people think of are the 3D printing, laser cutters. Um, we do have CNC routers, um, and that's a computer-controlled device that can cut out pieces of um, plastic or wood. Um, and, and the idea with these things is sometimes you only need it for one use. It doesn't make sense to go out and buy your own to use this, but if you had access to something that you could do a couple of runs on, um, and that's kind of the benefit of a, of a place like Fab Lab. We have all of these, uh, all the equipment, and the thing that you don't see when you come to the lab until you've been there for a while um, is the, the community that you become a part of, uh, and that's something that I really like to touch on because we've collected uh, a group of really passionate, and, and all labs do this, but the community culture of the labs um, really can't be spoken highly enough because it's it's through the contact with other people that have a little bit of information and knowledge in this field and these guys have knowledge in this field and you combine these things and suddenly um, you've got this this group of people that can really go and tackle a big problem um, all in one place actually that's that's one of the things i really wanted to touch on because there are some people who would love to be a maker but they feel a little well, daunted. They, they look around and they see the technology and they don't know how all of it works. They don't even know where to start a project. A maker lab is not just an, a, a combination of equipment. It is, as you said, that community, that expertise, which can make things like this. What is this, this drone thing I'm seeing on the table? Okay, so this is the uh, a early stage prototype of a drone one of the uh, members at our local lab is putting together. And uh, from design to what you see here was a five day process. So we can do things really quickly um, if we have uh, a good understanding of what it is that someone's trying to take, take on. And the reason why you would do it that way is because that's, that's really prototyping, right? I mean, you want to print a one-off, you want to make sure that the design's actually going to work in the real world before you send it off to a, a more expensive CNC. That's absolutely it. Um, it's the speed and the, the low cost of being able to do just a one-off print. Um, that's the value of the, the 3D printers that we're using that you're seeing become uh, very popular throughout the maker community. Now, Tyrone, one last question. If there was a young maker out there who wanted to start getting into a lab space, who wanted to get into the maker movement, what advice would you give him or her? And then where should they go to find more information about the Fab Lab? Oh, uh, that's a fantastic question. Getting involved has never been easier than it is now to get involved uh, in, in the maker movement, um, regardless of from what, what area you're coming from or how, how um, remedial your current skill level is. Um, that's what these things are here for. So don't, don't be, if you can find a group and they're becoming um, much more available, just get involved. Go in there and say, hey, I don't know what I'm doing. Can you help? And everyone's really happy to help. People that are in this community are really passionate about what they're doing and about sharing what it is that they know. I'm standing next to Chance, the drone guy from the Fab Lab in San Diego, who's going to explain to us what it takes to build a drone. Chance, thank you so very much for talking to us. Thanks for having me. Now, here on our program, we've had a lot of drones. We love drones. We love seeing drones. But most of them are the ones you buy from DJI, Definitely not the ones you build yourself. What do you need to build a drone? 
Well, the, there's quite a bit that goes into building a drone. There's first of all, you have to know the components: um, flight controller, flight computer, flight controller, uh, ESCs, motors, frame, batteries. There's a lot um, of different components that kind of you have to master or at least know a good amount about to figure out how to assemble it all. Now, the flight computer is really the brains of the of the beast because yeah. you've got. Four propellers all pointing upwards, you need something to balance out the thrust. How does that work? I mean, is it, is it open source? Do you have to program it yourself? Um, well, the ones we use are multi-Wii, and that is an open source project. Um, and essentially what happens is, is um, when a drone lists one way, then the, there's accelerometers and gyroscopes inside the drone that if, in, if it's going to the left, it turns the motors that are on the left uh, up a little bit and the ones that are on the right down a little bit. So, and it's constantly doing, doing that hundreds of times a second to uh, compensate for uh, attitude positioning. Now, you've created this drone, which is unique because it folds up. I believe we saw this in a previous segment. Now, the, the cool thing about this is this was all 3D printed, right? I mean, everything, I, I think, except for the metallic parts, you, you brought out of a 3D printer. Uh, everything except the electronics, right, has come out of a 3D, 3D printer. This is, I did this at the Maker Fair, at the, uh, sorry, at the Fab Lab in San Diego, and essentially, uh, that's the design, got the electronics inside, GPS, and um, so I, I ran a million dollar Kickstarter uh, called the Pocket Drone, and um, so I'm no longer working on that project, but now this is the next thing I'm working on, and uh, I'm kind of excited about where it's going, so, you know, but at, the maker, at the Fab Lab you can just kind of put an idea in the computer and spit it out on a little 3D printer, it's pretty cool. Now, it's not just electronics and 3D printing. There's actually some aeronautical know-how that needs to go into making a drone, right? I mean, you can't just put propellers on a rock. So how did you come up with this design? And, and let's say that our audience wants to, they want to make their own drone. What, what things should they have in the back of their mind? Well, actually, you can make a lot of things that you wouldn't think. Um, you know, it's not so aerodynamic. Um, so it, basically, it's four fans and a computer in the middle. And as long as it knows how to can compensate for the uh, accelerometer inside can make can make make it level, then it could potentially fly. So um, the, we've seen all types of things like dead cat. You know, they call it a dead cat, but it's really a drone that's kind of like in this in a dead cat the like position, um, and um, just a bunch of different kinds of interesting shapes and stuff like that. So you can make things that aren't aerodynamic fly, like a bee, right? The bees aren't inherently aerodynamic. So it's kind of the same theory. All right, so one last piece of secret sauce. If our people wanted to go out and start making their own drone, uh, can you mention some of the parts that they should pick up? I mean, of course, they're going to need the brain. They're going to need some, some motors. They're going to need some propellers. But where should they really dig in if they wanted to design and build their own drone? Probably the most popular one is DIY drones. I'm actually coming out with a new website soon called makerdrones.com. And we're going to be trying to cover a lot of that. DIY drones is more on the, kind of the, more on the technical side. We're trying to bring it to the masses, makerdrones.com. Chance, thank you very much for talking to us, and thank you for showing off your drone. And uh, stay tuned, because we're probably going to be rising. If you've been to enough of these shows, you've probably seen Cyberpunk. It's dark, it's gritty, and most of the time, it's beautiful. But what exactly makes cyberpunk and how do you make these beautiful pieces of costume? Well, I'm here with Trevor from Subverse Industries and he's going to tell us, well, what is steampunk? Trevor? Well, uh, steampunk is a sort of reimagining um, of modern art, technology, and culture, but through the lens of Victorian era aesthetic and culture. Steampunk is such a wonderful combination of, of as you said, that retro-futuristic, you know, laser guns with steam cannons and, and holsters made out of leather, that it, it, it's almost a style that people can't describe, but they know it the minute they see it. Right, yeah, that's the beautiful thing about steampunk, is it's so collaborative, and there's so many right ways to do it. Uh, if you are a tinkerer, you can make something that's steampunk and it's instantly recognizable as steampunk. Uh, you can come at it from the fashion angle, from all the literature, the, the novels out there. It's just such a robust world and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's an amazing collaboration. Okay, Trevor, I gotta ask you about your collection behind you because everything behind us is handmade, designed by you and your team. And, and I have to say, I've seen some bad steampunk in my days. I mean, it, good attempts, but not quite there. How do you go about 
actually designing the holsters and the hats and all the accoutrements that, that make your style? Well, uh, I got to give credit to, to my community. You know, it's, it's really, uh, I'm inspired by the people around me all the time. It's a lot of uh, beautiful characters. Uh, the, whole, the whole Bay Area, specifically steampunk community, is just vibrant and amazing. And, uh, you know, it, it starts there. And then I think about function and, and form and uh, throw in a little passion and love. And, and we end up with some pretty awesome stuff, I think. There are some people who wonder what you would use steam for in the modern day. Well, here at Kinetic Steamworks, they figured out that steam works great for personal relaxation. Baker Fair has a lot of things for the mind, but it also has a few things for the body. I'm here with Candice at Holistic Hooping, who, um, well, you advocate hooping? Yes, I do. Hooping for mind, body, and spirit. It uh, is really uplifting and a great activity for the whole family. Now, one of the things about Maker Faire is it is, you know, it is part Burning Man, so we do get sort of a free spirit going on. Now, you can tell people are really happy when they're doing this thing, but, uh, you know, hula hooping I thought was dead. Oh, it's coming back with a vengeance. You can find it at local gyms and yoga studios all over the country now. Thank you, Candice. Now, can you tell the folks where they can find you? Of course, you can find us online, holistichooping.com, handmade hula hoops for your health and healing. There you know, there you have it. If you want to get a little healthy, try a little hooping. I'm at the Ford booth where they're bringing back a little bit of nostalgia for geeks of a certain age. You may remember building one of these. Now this little block of wood is actually a high performance race car. It's the Pine Wood Derby. The idea is to take your block of wood along with some pins and some wheels and turn it into a high performance competition vehicle, hopefully looking more like this. Now over the next couple of minutes, I'm gonna show you some of the steps that you need to go through in order to build yourself a viable Pine Wood Derby car and uh, maybe I'll win a couple of races. Now this seemingly poorly put together pine wood derby car actually has some very innovative features. The first thing is, you see how the tires are bent? That, that's not a defect. You, you actually want to keep one of the wheels off the ground. Believe it or not, that actually decreases the amount of rolling friction. There's very minimum air friction that you're going to get off a pine wood derby car, but the, the friction you get from the wheels touching the track actually does incur a little bit of a penalty. So if you bend one wheel up, it's going to keep it off the ground as it runs down that slot, and in turn, it's going to decrease the amount of rolling friction. The other thing that you're going to see is the front left uh, wheel is actually slightly cambered inwards. The reason for that is it's going to force the car to ride up against the, uh, the track, against the slot. The reason why you want to do that is because you don't want your car bouncing back and forth on that track. You want it to actually ride the ridge. Now this is a really tricky uh, way to run it because if you do it too much, you're going to increase the amount of friction. And you're not going to run at all. If you do it too little, you're going to end up bouncing back and forth. So we're going to take this car and we're going to put it on the track and see if any of my uh, sort of home shop theories work. Now a lot of the kids are going to be designing their cars with special features. I've included a halo and a giraffe along with a lot of Ford stickers because I think that's going to give me the best chance to, to win the derby. On your mark, get set, go! What? What? Go! If you're going to be a maker, you need a maker space. Now you could try to repurpose something in your home, or you could just build your own. I'm here with David Wilson at Avava, and we're going to talk all about the Folly One. Well, this is a, it's a unique product. Essentially, it's, it looks like a prefab, but it's not really. This is what we call a flat pack construction. It's pre-assembled, and we have 18 parts that make up the main structure that you see behind me. The idea is that uh, anyone, any two people could put this together in a matter of minutes using common hand tools. 
Now, we just saw you both disassemble this thing in, in about 10 minutes and put it back together in about 13. And it's designed out of wood. It's designed so it could be compressed down into, a, what is it, 8 by 12, which means that you could shove roughly 15 to 20 of these in the back of a 40-foot trailer. Yeah, that's the idea, is that we can put a lot into a small space and then make a lot bigger spaces down the road, wherever you need them. Okay, now I, I get that, and I, it's cool. I love the ability to sort of pop up a city, a little structure when you need it. But what are you selling this for? I mean, what market do you want this to go in? Is it, is it disaster preparedness? Is it just temporary structures? Uh, where, where do you see the Folly One finding its, its niche? We, we really don't have a niche. We're looking at the entire market. We're looking at pop-up buildings. We're looking at rear yard offices and additional rooms. Uh, pretty much anything you want to do with it. It's your, you have the space, you do with it what you want. Okay, let's, let's geek out for a second here. All right, now you chose an all wood construction. Why is that? I mean, I know a lot of others would, would say, well, let's go with, with plastic. Let's go with some high impact materials. Let's use a lot of metal in it. But you went all natural. The reason is that we think that wood construction is about 100 years behind the times. We think that with these engineered wood products like eye joists and plywood, that we're not taking advantage of the, in, the properties that are inherent in the products. So we designed the joist lock uh, as a way to, to use the inherent properties of the eye joists to lock them together at the intersections and create moment frames. And that's something that no one else has done. All right, now let's get down to brass tacks. People are going to say, okay, well, how much does one of these structures cost? And how many permits am I going to have to get to, to drop this in front of my house so that I can have my own little maker space? So the, the structure you see behind me is the basic maker fair model. It's the do-it-yourself. We give you a roof, we give you a floor, and we give you the four corners. Uh, the basic kit comes in a flat pack that's four feet by eight feet by about 30 inches off the ground. And that goes for $2,500. The, uh, the more deluxe versions go anywhere uh, from there up to about 10,500, which is the one that's behind me that we call the Tesla model. And uh, what about that permits issue? Because I know there's a lot of people who are like, wait a minute, I can't just drop something in front of my house and have the city go crazy on me? Well, that's the entire reason we designed the, sa the shape and size the way we did, because it's 8 feet by 12 feet, which gives you 96 square feet. That's less than 100 square feet, which most cities require permits at and then it's less than eight feet off the ground. That's one of the reasons that we use pressure treated wood for the floor so that you can actually put it on the ground and you don't have to worry about getting uh, coming into contact with water over the long term. So $2,500 you don't have to worry about permits and you can build your own space. That's correct. If you've done any sort of electronic design, you know what a pain in the butt it is to bake your own PCB. It normally involves some drilling, a copper cladboard, a lot of chemicals, and a lot of time. Well, what if I told you that you could get your own quick prototype simply by drawing it? I'm here at the AGIC booth with Shinya Shimizu, who's going to explain to us what their technology can do. What is all of this? This is conductive silver ink with which you can just draw circuits. You're not, you know, asking PCB manufacturers to manufacture the PCB. The nice thing about this is it's really for fast prototyping. So if you've got an idea, you want to get it on paper, you can actually draw out the circuits to make sure that it's going to work. And it's essentially the same as printing a circuit board, only you're looking at a turnaround time of seconds rather than hours or days. Now tell me, it's, it's not just this, right? Because no one drew this. What, what's, what's this that you're holding? This is a conductive inkjet circuit printer. So here's actual printer here. So with which you can just print electronic circuit with normal inkjet printer with our special conductive ink. Now, one of the things I noticed about this is you've actually got components fastened to the board. Does that require some sort of special glue? Yeah, so you can use conductive glue instead of soldering. But this is even easier than soldering. Yeah. All right, so if I were to ask you who you're pitching this for, who do you want to buy this product, who do you think should buy your product, who would you tell the audience is the, uh, the target for Silver Conductive Ink? Anyone who wants to enter the maker space, I would say. Because, you know, because of the 3D printer, now you can make um, any plastic very easily, but, you know, electric circuits is still very 
difficult part and time consuming part. But with a printer, you can print uh, electronic circuit board immediately in two or three minutes. Now, Shingya, here's the big question. Price, availability, and where do they go to find out more about AJIC? All right. So we just finished Kickstarter project. So we're not selling right now, but printer, the ready-to-use printer is going to be available for six hundred dollars, and uh, the cost per print is just two or three dollars, which is quite cheap. And the pen is available for fifteen dollars, uh, twelve dollars here, and fifteen dollars includes a paper and some kits. Yeah, which is available at Maker Fair. <laughs> well, Shigya, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you for this because, I mean, this is going to inspire a new generation of IC makers. I'm Father Robert Ballas here, and uh, go draw yourself a circuit. Over the past couple of days, we've seen a lot of things at Maker Fair. We've seen the future of single residency occupancies. We've seen the future of custom circuitry and 3D printed materials. We've even seen electric cars and art that kind of blow your mind. Now, there are a lot of people who would say that something like Maker Faire, seeing all this artwork, all this, this stuff that transcends just simple science, art, or technology, is really just the ego of the people who are making. That's not the case. It's not about the people who are making now. It's about the future generations of Maker. The men and the women, the boys and the girls, who will be dreaming of the next generation of art, science, and technology. I'm Father Robert Balasser saying goodbye from Maker Fair 2014.